Um, but I can just imagine the news correspondents in Jerusalem saying, just behind where I'm standing, you can see the garden where the empty tube is. I can't get in right now because the forensic uh, people have taped it off to do their forensic studies, and there would be a lot of, of brouhaha. And the print media would announce, tomb empty, crucified one seen alive, carrying the story that the body of a simple preacher from the, from the country had been executed like a common thief, but had disappeared from his final resting place. In the story, though, that we get in the, in the Bible, in the Gospel of Mark, it reads, and I quote, early in the morning on the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, came to the tomb as the sun was just rising. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? For it is very large. And they looked and saw that the stone was rolled away. And they entered the tomb and saw a young man sitting on the right, covered with a white robe, and they were astonished. But he said to them, do not be afraid. You seek Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold the place where he was laid. Friends, I want to say to you the morning, this morning that the implication of that empty tomb is great for each and every one of us this morning. For in a very real sense, the Easter story is our story. It's about our awakening and our rising up and our overcoming. You see, from the orthodox view, the Easter is some kind of passport to another world. But rather, the Easter story, as we interpret it in the New Thought movement, is a time to reappraise the principle that makes all overcoming possible. And so I want us to think about those events, and I want to focus this morning on something that perhaps is overlooked sometimes when we are reading this story. It's the stone, the stone that was rolled away. Now, you know, when the stone is rolled away, we all know what you find inside, the glory of our spiritual magnificence, the glory of the Christ's presence, which is in everyone. But what is this stone? What does this stone represent? And to continue that metaphor of the stone, I want to tell you another parable. It's a story from, from ancient times about a king who wanted to, to test the values of his subjects. And so he instructed his servants to block the main road into the kingdom with a large boulder. I didn't know they had CVM in those days. We block the road and call out CVM. We want justice. But he had the, his servants block the road with a really heavy boulder. And then he, he secreted himself nearby to watch and see what would happen. And of course, uh, the elite of the land passed by and s some just went by the stone. Others stood and looked at it and, and, and said, why doesn't the government do something? You know, we're paying all these taxes and they can't keep the roads clear. Um, people had various comments. A few stopped and tried to move it, made a few feeble efforts, and when it wouldn't budge, they went about their business. Along came a peasant, uh, a vegetable seller, according to the story, uh, with his cart of vegetables. And when he saw the boulder, he put his, his load of vegetables down, and he put his shoulder to the stone and started to push. Of course, it barely budged. So he summoned all his strength, and he pushed and pushed and rolled and shoved until he got the stone out of the way. And just as he was about to pick up back his load of vegetables to continue his journey, he noticed a purse in the middle of the road where the stone had been. And so he picks it up, and it's filled with gold coins and a note from the king saying, whoever moved the stone would have the gold. So you see, friends, it's important when we move the stone to, to know that there is treasure to be had. And in the case of the Easter story, it's the treasure of our own spiritual magnificence. So then, what is the stone? The stone is our belief in our separation from Almighty God. 
The stone is that which prevents us from knowing that we are divine. And that was the message of Jesus the way sure, that all humans are divine, and that that divinity is ours for the taking. If only we would roll away the stone of our disbelief, the stone of our discontent, the stone of our, our resentment and, and unforgiveness, the stone of our holding on to past hurts and past grievances, the stone of superstition and false beliefs, the stone of prejudice and judgment, the stone that keeps us separated from our God self, the self that we were born to be and to, to live to the honor and glory of God. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our great teaching, in his uh, writing called The Journey Into Life, writes, and I quote, Today, the horizon is clear. The voyage starts anew. We are reborn. The true resurrection is not only from this life into the next. It takes place daily and hourly as we shed the limited concepts of life and come into the vineyard to gather the fruit of the spirit hanging rich from the vines of God. A person may be reborn, remade, and renewed in mind and body just through taking a little time to get acquainted with his or her better self, just through coming to recognize the invisible and almost unknown guest who accompanies everyone through life, the spiritual presence within. Holmes continues, we should resurrect ourselves to the joy and simplicity and spontaneity of life and leave the corpses of our dead yesterdays in the tomb of their own obscurity. We should live more abundantly in God this day so that when we come out of our tomb of ignorance and disbelief, what a glorious dawn it will be. End of that quote from Ernest Holmes. You know, friends, the wonderful thing about the Bible and its stories is that there are many levels of meaning and we can all take from the stories in the Bible the level that suits our place in the journey, where we have reached. So I want you to think this morning about what are the obstacles to your joy and your happiness? What are the obstacles to your recognizing your oneness with that awesome presence and power that created you out of itself, called by many names and worshipped in many different forms, but ever one, one God, one infinite intelligence, one presence and one power that you can call upon at any time to lift you up and to resurrect you out of the tomb of sadness and despair and sometimes situations that we would not have asked for, but we know that we can live through it when we roll away the stone and look up. And the other thing those women did, I always say, it's always the women who are there on spot to take care of things, isn't it? It's always the women who go to the hospital. I just was visiting a, a, a dear friend, and what, the men stay outside in the car. I'm just going to find a parking spot. You go on in and I will come. You don't see them. It's the women who, 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 I think from the, from the womb to the tomb, look after us. And it really is a sacred role and a sacred mission. And I just want to honor all the women of the world for this giving of themselves in service to humanity. So the keynote of the Easter demonstration is you are divine. No matter what you have thought of yourself or done in your life or with it. You are divine. Dwell in this consciousness for even a few moments and wonderful things happen because in that moment when you recognize it, things take on a different perspective for you. And so your assignment this week is I want you to pause at least three times during the day, take a piece of paper and simply write, I am divine, hallelujah. Can we say that? I am divine. Hallelujah. I don't believe that hallelujah sounds very, very tame. Let's try it again. I am divine. Hallelujah. 
Do it about three times a day. Just pause, take three deep breaths, and write it. There's a link between writing and R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G. Um, write it. I am divine. Hallelujah. And every time I have to write it, I have to look up the spelling. <laughs> to do this, what I call inner chamber prayer, this inner recognition, it will help to move that boulder and help you to look up. And that's the other thing the woman did. They looked up. Because if you are bowed by the weight of grief and disappointment and disenchantment with life, you're looking down. But when you look up, there are blue skies. And there is the hope and the love and the knowing and the assurance that right where you are, God is in radiant expression. In our first hymn this morning, we sang, Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. I do not want you to miss or mistake the deep implications of this Easter anthem, my friends. What you are really saying is, Christ, which is my own sonship or daughtership with God, is risen in me. And this resurrection enables me to see that which is risen in every person in the world. You know, friends, in our Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life program in the prisons and for the YWCA School Leavers program, Reverend Michael Record, Reverend Ann Shand, practitioner Carol Charlton and I oftentimes are blessed to witness people rising up in that awakening. Every now and then, for somebody, the, t the stone does get rolled away and they see life through different eyes and through a different perspective. And one such young man um, said to me one day in class how grateful he was to have been apprehended and sent to prison. He was glad. He gave thanks every day that he was apprehended and sent, sent to prison. Strange? To quote him, and I quote, my life was a living hell. If I wasn't here, I would be in a pine box. All that you might have read about me was not even 10% of the evil I was doing, unquote. This is a man who was mild-mannered and a leader among um, the, 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 the people in, in that community, um, showing the way, putting youngsters right, um, coaching and counseling. And so I said to him, when did you have this shift? What made this shift? And he told me a story which was a story of resurrection. He said, I was in the lockup at Halfway Tree, and a policeman bashed me in the face with his gun butt. I fell backwards, and the corner of a table gashed a hole in the back of my head. As I lay on the floor with hatred and fear pouring from my wounds, a policewoman lifted my head into her lap. God chose one of the very people at whom my rage was directed to show me another way, the way of love. And he said she put her hand on his heart as she was holding him in her lap, and he actually felt the change come over him in that instant. And you know, for me, the image of a bleeding man lying across the lap of a compassionate police woman brought to mind the beautiful Michelangelo sculpture of the Pieta, which depicts Mary holding Jesus in similar fashion. So you see, the Bible stories are really our stories. You think about the times that you have been down. You might not have been bashed or gashed, but you may have been down, face down in the dirt, and there were friends there to hold you, to put your, your head in their lap and say, me day for you. Um, and that's what this whole business of living is about for me. Michael Beckwith said, um, he's one of our New Thought um, luminaries, if you have, you have got to stand when you are feeling hopeless and vision has been tossed upon a stormy sea, joy is there in your soul. Get on up and stand and say, God is enough for me. And so my friends, today as millions of people throughout Christendom uh, uh, proclaim the words, he is risen, hallelujah, he is risen. Let us emulate the great demonstration by rolling the stone away and looking up in consciousness to the spirit that indwells us.
Let us look beyond appearances and see the stones of human limitation and disunity rolled away, and let us see the divinity in all people. This is the Easter story. This is your story. So I know for each of you that the risen Christ consciousness within you enables you to see that Christ is risen in you and in every other person in the world. Happy Easter. Namaste.